Welcome, everyone, to another episode of HR and Payroll 2.0. I'm Pete Tiliakis, and as always, I'm joined by the legendary Julie Fernandez. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, Pete. Doing great. Can't wait to talk about some of the places we've been and the things that we've seen. Oh, I know. And you're calling in from uh, a global location, I understand, today. <laughs> I you want to share am. that with the, with the audience? <laughs> Absolutely. I, um, we're, uh, I'm in Cancun today and this oh, week. So, very um, good. So, yep, getting a little bit of fresh air and sunshine. I love it. I love it. I knew Mexico. I didn't realize it was Cancun. I forgot to <laughs> forgot that part. But lucky you. Hopefully you get to be uh, on the beach getting tanned and, um, you know, relaxing at least a little bit. So, uh, um, yeah, good good deal. I love Mexico. I've been many, many times with my family. It's always been a great experience. That's right. Well, yes. let's dive in. We got fun stuff to do. I know. I know. We have a lot. We have a lot in store here. We've been doing some traveling. We've been at some events. Uh, we want to recap those. As always, we've got market news, and a lot of our market news is um, revolving around the topic of artificial intelligence. Uh, Chat GPT has everybody in a uh, in a in a roar, <laughs> in, in positive ways and negative ways. There's been a lot of funny things coming out of there, so wanted to talk about that. And then, of course, um, yeah, we want to get into talk a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning within the HR space. There's so much. There's so much opportunity here. I'm excited. I'm also understand there are people who have apprehensions. You know, again, is this a game changer or is this game over for HR uh, is our title this week. And so we're going to dig into that uh, at least at a, at, a, at, a, at a high level and get get some discussion going on that. So uh, let's start off maybe with some some events. Julie, um, maybe uh, I'll get us started. I, I, I was uh, I did, too, uh, here in Atlanta, which was really been a blessing to have events right in my backyard uh, in the Big Peach. It was it was a really good time. So I was able to go down to uh, see the, the, the guys that I solved. Um, if you're not familiar with I solved, I solved is an HCM technology platform, uh, incredibly mature solution. W one of my favorites, uh, an amazing C-suite and, and just a great team. So I was fortunate to sit in on one of their roadshow stops uh, where they brought in uh, a, a small segment of their customers uh, across major cities and um, and really just have a dialogue around the challenges that they're facing and the things that I is doing to help them. Um, and really just got to look at the product uh, in terms of where they're headed from a roadmap standpoint. So really great day and really, really enjoyed being there. So thank you to Amberly Dressler and, and Lena Tonk, the CMO, for uh, for having me. I really appreciated that. Um, and Julie, you were at, you were at uh, Shared Services and Outsourcing, I understand. I was. Just last week was the yeah. 27th annual Shared Services and Outsourcing Conference. It's one of the biggest and only um, conferences for folks that are standing up shared services, not only in HR, but also in other back office areas like finance and accounting and, yeah. and supply chain and so forth. And uh, they do quite a, a show every, um, every spring in March. They had a thousand attendees um, this year. Um, I think that does include uh, speaker sponsors, so, uh, but still quite, quite a large gathering. And a couple of highlights I thought I would mention from the yeah. SSOW event, the Shared Services and Outsourcing Week event, you know, there's always a state of the union uh, type of presentations and the SSOW just does tons of research um, and gathers data. And they presented that a universe of 10,497 delivery centers around wow. the world that are on the radar. And it was curious to see that, you know, there was actually somewhat equal distribution with 33 to 3,600 in the Americas, in Europe, and in Asia pack. So oh, many, wow. Folks on our, you know, in our side of the pond here are quite familiar with shared services uh, in the Americas. But if you're not really true global and, and much larger, you may forget that, you know, that there's just as much delivery center activity uh, in the other regions as there is at home. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Yeah. I'm lucky you. I, I've always wanted to uh, check out that event. I've never been. Uh, I'm a big fan of the SSON um, and uh, have spoken for them actually with uh, Amidas was the last time I did one. Amidas, the global payroll provider. Um, I will tell you, any of the firms that are listening, if you're a vendor listening, especially if you're in marketing, I think that the SSON is an area that a lot of vendors overlook. And I think that that's a fantastic uh, organization that you can find a lot of, I don't want to call them captive, but sort of Folks that are at a level uh, in HR and and and, and finance, uh, both obviously those two mixes, but but folks that are fundamentally bought into the idea of shared services and outsourcing as a strategic path. So it's always yeah. kind of refreshing to be in that group, and I, I've always enjoyed it. And a lot, lot of great, uh, a lot of great content comes out of there. So yeah, really good stuff. Maybe, yeah. Let me just mention that you know the whole format for that, especially for those who aren't vendors but who are um, who are practitioners 
is really uh, focused on hearing from your peers. So yes. um, the format doesn't necessarily find a way for vendors um, to share uh, and be the presentation speakers. Um, I worked with Heidelberg Materials and we did a, um, a presentation on payroll transformation journey. Yes. Cool. And um, that was wonderful. So thanks Yvette Delian for um, for uh, agreeing to be a speaker at the session um, with a lot of peers. And I would say also, just so folks aren't surprised, it, it isn't an HR specific event. So um, yes. as you might imagine, there's a universe of finance folks that maybe doubles the size of ours. And so if you go, you should know. Um, there is one in the fall in Las Vegas in September. But if you're at all interested as a practitioner, uh, I do an HR networking dinner uh, every event on the first day because it is just incredibly, you know, it can be incredibly challenging and frustrating to try to find your HR peers. And that just makes it very personal and folks get a chance to find each other and, and recognize yeah. each other and share their stories. That's what everybody wants to do at these. Yeah, that's what these events should be about is the community, right? I mean, I think that the networking gets, um, it's it's certainly valuable, but it gets it gets under, almost undersold. It's, it's beyond... Um, it's beyond helpful, I know, in my role, but it has to be for a practitioner out there. So, yeah, no, I love the SSO in, and you're right. There is a great audience of finance and HR, um, you know, practitioners and leaders that are in there that I think that, uh, like I said, I think a lot of the vendors maybe overlook this one. They're commonly focused on the GPMI and the APA as they should be or the SHRM. Uh, or the GPA, but I think the shared service and outsourcing network is one that uh, I'd love to see more more vendors get involved in. So, yeah, very good. Um, the other one, big one, we were both at uh, oddly at different tracks. I was uh, in a more of a, I think a, a, a buy side executive sort of forum where you were more in the partner behind the scenes, behind the curtains forum at the uh, ADP meeting of the minds. Um, uh, great event. It was here in Atlanta this time. It's always in a different city in the U.S. It's it's ADP's premier sort of North American event. Uh, 1,600 attendees this year, and and really just a great um, a great buzz, right? Everyone seemed really happy to again to be together. Uh, a lot of great networking and sharing going on, and a lot of focus on HCM technology. I was really really not surprised. I know ADP's been building um, some strong solutions uh, over the last few five, four, five, six years. Really being very aggressive. Uh, but it was interesting to me to see how many firms, particularly emerging firms, were there making HCM platform buying decisions and looking at ADP in context with the big, you know, the, the, the big players that you would expect to see. So, so kudos to ADP. Obviously, their roadmap is working, and um, yeah, just a great event. But uh, what was your perspective, Julie? You're on a different different side of the curtain, as as yeah. I said. Yeah. yeah, so I was in a different capacity, and actually, I think you know, ADP uh, Merits has really earned a huge call out here because they did something I don't think they've ever tried before, and that is to bring the incredible, the incredibly large client and prospect market that is usually part of meeting in the minds, and and there there's exhibitions and their their vendors and their partners and their marketplace folks, right? So it's just a huge event together with what are smaller events and more targeted events. The one that I participate in is the Global Partner Summit. Um, that gives us behind the scenes look at roadmap and uh, implementation progress and what's going on in service delivery for aftermarket clients. And I think there was also the day that I left on Thursday, there was the uh, Executive Summit, right? And so yes. they brought all of their stakeholders together. They're really building community in a way that they haven't built it before, uh, you know, maybe as obviously. And it, uh, I, I hope that that pays off for them, um, getting so many folks together. Yes. Um, what I will say from the Global Partner Summit perspective is, yeah, this is a, this is a, a time, a, a really intensive day long, when folks who work uh, quite a bit with ADP uh, service offerings get a chance to interact with, I think there were 19 uh, senior most leaders uh, in the ADP organization. What I really enjoyed most, Pete, was they had a new format, or I think, you know, it was very effective format this year. Some of the, each of the major product lines brought forward a three-person panel. Oh, to nice. Discuss, um, to discuss, you know, what's going on with the product and the roadmap. Um, you know, a person who is the lead of their implementation activity and another person who leads the service delivery activity and put them together in a panel. And so we walked through a panel on the Solergo Streamline product for awesome. a lot of the global payroll. We walked through a similar panel with um, Global View folks and uh, not only Global View, you know, in the sense that of course it serves the globe, but also their North American group and their, you know, specific to North American clients where they have about 230 of those that 
use Global View as a U.S., Canada, or Mexico platform. Wow. Um, you might not think that, right? But, yeah. But it, but it is what it is. And then the third um, trinity of, of, of leaders uh, came from the workforce management side. Yes. And so, uh, so that allowed not only a great, you know, holistic view across the suite of these offerings. We did have a little bit on NextGen or Lithion, right, the, which is the part that you highlighted earlier, a couple other sessions. But these three areas you know, we're just uh, made for very interactive, holistic conversations and a lot of time for Q&A uh, with the leaders uh, from the audience. And so it's always a great, uh, great event to, for getting caught up and uh, up to speed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and always a diverse set of organizations that are there. Um, and I think a lot of folks think that that ADP is really just these North American small businesses. And I didn't really I mean, it, it, yes, there's a lot of their businesses is full of that. Uh, certainly it's where, where I think their sweet spot was and is. Um, but I ran into so many mid-market firms that were outgrowing where they were and looking at ADP as part of their future solution. So, um, it's not, uh, I, I don't think this is your, your parents ADP anymore. Right. I mean, uh, and we're going to have a blog on this where I, I should, t I should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, you and I are both put together uh, a great POV on our perspectives from each of those. And we're, we're putting that out, uh, very soon this week, um, uh, in our, in our, uh, across our channel. So look for that soon, but, um, may maybe I could talk a little bit about what, you know, the, where the focus is for ADP in terms of their their product, if, if you don't mind, Julie. Yeah, um, so certainly, and I think this fits beautifully with our theme, right? I mean, AI and ML were well on display here uh, in this, you know, in the theme of what they were talking about along the product lines um, and really looking to predict, be more predictive, proactive, and personalized in terms of leveraging their data. Obviously, data cloud with a million customers, right? I mean, you're talking about one of the biggest HR data sets on the planet. Uh, ADP activated that several years ago in data cloud, and it really underpins the capabilities uh, or, or excuse me, the uh, the insights that they're able to surface across all of their product offerings. But one of the things I really, really enjoyed uh, hearing them talk about was just the focus on the intelligent service delivery, right? Using chatbots and virtual assistants to help with policy personalization, uh, localized, right, to the employee's unique um obviously location and what they're doing. Um, well, I love the, uh, the, just the constructs around, you know, nudging employees with data to help them, right? I, they showed a great use case of uh, an employee looking to uh, maybe enter their time and it was reminding them, hey, uh, by now, most employees have used about 80% of their time off in this year. Um, you've used less than 10% and you have none scheduled for the rest of the year. You know, did you want to maybe start to, to look at that? And I think that's a phenomenal um, that's a phenomenal example of where employees can be provided um, guidance to say, hey, did you know, right? And and by the way, here's what you could do about it. And that's that's what I love. Um, yeah. You know, they're, they're, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we saw some similar nudges and kind of um, sneak previews. Yeah. And uh, also in the area, you know, I guess focused a little bit more in the back office area, but the idea of nudging for missed time punches, right? Yes. Something that's a high volume activity. Um, that a lot of providers are looking at. And so, yeah. um, so it was nice to see, you know, some of that being baked in. Yeah. You know, the other thing I really thought was super simple, but, but, but I, I'm not sure you, you're seeing this in the same way is, you know, they've got the uh, sort of post paycheck experience sentiment, right? That they're coming to employees and very simply asking them, how was your payroll experience, right? Post the paycheck being delivered. Uh, and now that employee may have never called for anything. That employee may have never done anything different than they normally do and then put their time in and, 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 and work their, their shift. Um, but to reach out to them and sort of say, hey, how, how was your experience? What, how could it be better? I think that's great, right? I, I think that's uh, an excellent step in the right direction. And when you start to connect that and those nudges and the data that's sitting there, um, I think you're going to really get better outcomes for, for payroll and, and, and many other areas of HR that I know we're going to talk a little bit about later. Um, and then, of course, yeah. And then, of course, I think there was a lot of focus on talent intelligence, right? Um, leveraging that data, leveraging benchmarks and insights and really surfacing uh, the types of um, skills and career profiles that uh, the workers will need in order to be best fit for a, a, an environment. So, uh, yeah, it was really exciting. I, I had a good time. Uh, a lot of great conversations, a lot of good stuff coming from ADP and just a relentless focus on the user experience, the employee experience, the practitioner uh, and yeah, I, I was excited to see, to see all of it. So good event Absolutely. all yeah, around. Great. Yeah. yeah. Great event so, and uh, great job ADP. Yeah. So where are you next, Julie? What's, uh, what's next up for you in terms of events? 
Well, I have a couple of maybe the same ones as you on your uh, radar, but the one that might be unique to uh, us both is I think you might know that I've started a quarterly uh, HR webinar series. This yes, we yes. We it last year. Uh, we've done one already so far, and the next quarterly webinar that I'll be hosting from Heron Palmer's site is on May 23rd, and uh, I'm speaking of the skills and talent intelligence topic. Um, we'll be going there and we'll be going there, you know, in typical fashion, you know, just calling out what is uh, what, what's really happening and, and what's kind of noise and how do we get from noise to what's happening or what should be happening. So look for that on May 23rd. I think you have a couple of things coming up before then that we might see each other. at. Yes, yes. Yeah, I actually have uh, reminds me I have a webinar coming up on the 19th. Let me just double check that I believe it's the 19th with one source virtual we're doing a uh, discussion on how to get the most out of your people and your data. Uh, and that's, you know, payroll, obviously going to play heavily into that, but also core, you know, core HR. So uh, look for that April 19th. Uh, and then, of course, I'm going to be at Unleash in Vegas um, the week of April 26th to the 27th, I believe it is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my, my my good friend Steve Goldberg will be there with me, my partner in crime, and we will be speaking uh, at that event. We haven't entirely nailed down what we're going to talk about yet, but uh, that is forthcoming. And then, of course, we've got the APA Congress coming up. Um, are you going to be there? Okay. Julie, yeah, I think you are. Yeah, I think you and I are going to be doing yes. some sort of fireside chat with Nathan, and so uh, I hope so. Forward to being there and uh, checking that out and sharing that with folks. So I hope, yes. I hope if you're going, uh, folks out there, you you sh give us a shout out so we can connect while we're there. Yes, good. Yeah, I, I love the APA Congress. I call it the Super Bowl of payroll. Uh, I will be uh, well displayed there. I've got a keynote, uh, a breakout session, a couple of panels with a few vendors. Uh, I'm doing some podcasting there with the vendors. Um, yeah. And so just, just really excited for that, uh, up in Denver and I've never been to Denver, so I, I'm going to make a trip out of it personally, awesome. uh, for that week. Yeah. Never been to Colorado actually, which is Great. weird. Well, it, should a, it should be a little bit, uh, it should be a little bit warmer by the time we get there in May. Yes. Yes. I hope, I hope. Okay. Let's do a little bit of market news. And then I thought we could jump into our topic of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So right out of the gate, right? We've seen, uh, and look, this is not um, a knock on, on Workday or anyone else, but we've seen the, uh, the recent uh, lawsuit that's come out around AI bias, right? Uh, and just to give you a little bit of background on this, uh, a gentleman, I'd say he's in a protected class. I believe he is uh, black. He is, uh, I think they said he's over 40. And um, fundamentally considered, um, you know, again, I think he's also disabled. I think there's a disability listed as well. So obviously a protected class. Uh, this gentleman is claiming that Workday is biased and that the AI um, eliminates people uh, in, in his groups from being able to obtain work, right? So he's alleging, I think, 80 to 100 applications that he applied to through Workday. Now, I don't know if these were workday specific jobs or it was workday it was jobs leveraging the workday platform meaning it, it was other employers I, I believe it could be maybe both um you know the gentleman is well credentialed uh multiple degrees uh and certainly some you know good background I, I, from what i can glean from the story uh lots of questions i would ask here and, and i and i'm not saying one way or the other that this is right wrong or indifferent or who who you know who if anyone is actually at fault here for doing anything wrong uh, but this gentleman is claiming that the system is biased, right? And the system is 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 eliminating him from being able to get any of these jobs or any sort of uh, advancement. So not sure where this is going to lead to, but this has certainly opened up a can of worms, right? And at least opened up the questions of what is the AI doing? You know, we, we, there, there's so much around. It's going to replace us all, right? We're all going to be jobless, um, which I think is, is, is we're going to talk about a little bit. But the reality of it is, is that these things are here. Um, it's not even to say they're coming anymore. They are, they're, 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 they're at scale being, being built into all of the solutions that are being uh, created today. I don't know of a modern vendor building a modern capability that does not have some level of AI, machine learning, or NLP, if not all three of them. So um, I will leave it at this though. Uh, again, we'll, we're going to keep an eye on, see how, how this goes. But um, you know, I was following the Workday Summit um, a couple of weeks ago while I was at ADP Meeting of the Minds. Uh, and I have been to the Workday Summit. I believe they might do one for partners, but they do one for analysts every year. A handful of analysts are brought in for this innovation summit, and we get direct access to everything Workday is doing kind of future forward um, and, and what they're thinking and, and get time with their executives. And so I was following some of the tweets. Uh, I think I picked this one up from Stacia Gar, uh, my good friend over at Red Thread, the, the founder of Red Thread Research. Um, and she mentioned that Anil Bursary said, you know, in a statement, like, look, 
reminded everyone that Workday is a, is a data processor. The platform is a data processor and that the customer's data, uh, it's theirs, right? And they need to decide how they're going to use these algorithms, algorithms, excuse me. And I think it, it, it does, it, it sounds kind of like, hey, it's not our responsibility, but, and I don't think that that's what's meant here. I, I know, in fact, Workday takes a very, very serious approach to their Workday, or excuse me, their AI ethics. But I think the point that he's trying to it, it, you know, communicate here is that you need to understand what these things are doing. You need to understand how they work and how they're being applied to your organization and your use cases uh, and, and really be involved. And I think that that's a, a very, very um, uh, you know, uh, necessary thing that folks need to hear, right? You need to be under the hood on this stuff and really understand what your, uh, what your, what your organization, what your data is doing and, and how it's being used. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see where this goes. You know, Workday today, but uh, I remember one of the earliest cases back in 2018. I think yes. I or, or podcasted about it or exactly how I was involved in um, bringing it up. But uh, Amazon, right? Had, yes. Uh, was an early adopter of some algorithms used in a recruiting tool. And, um, it, it, you know, and there was some accusations or uh, um, it, it potentially showed bias against women. And so they pulled it right right away. And so. Um, you know, I do think that's a big part of what we're hoping to talk about a little bit today is, uh, you know, the potential and the risk, uh, and it's a tool. So the potential for good and for bad, and it has to be monitored and you have to assign risk to it. But, um, yeah, yeah. it's like any new technology, right? Like I, I remember, I mean, I can't, I mean, I know it's going to date me, but I remember when the internet came into the workplace, like that was such a, you know, it was such a, um, a mind blowing thing, first of all, but also we created all these new things that HR and everyone had to kind of address. Right. Um, and so just like anything, I think, and, and don't get me wrong. I think this is maybe even equally, if not more impactful, uh, and game changing, especially for HR, uh, than the internet. But I think that, you know, like any technology, you're, you're going to have to make decisions about your environment and really understand how you're, how you're leveraging these things and make sure that they're augmenting. Uh, and and doing positive things and not um, being used for nefarious reasons or anything like that. So, yeah. so yeah. Okay. So some of our other news that again has dominated the uh, <laughs> the, the airwaves has been uh, Chat GPT, right? Um, so I thought we could talk a little bit about some of the announcements that came out of OpenAI, which is the organization who is developing this. And I don't know if you've seen it, but but the um, the founder uh, and I always forget his name. I think it's Sam. I want to say it starts with an A. Uh, he's been giving a number of interviews to really talk about about what they're doing and why and, and, and the power of this thing. And when I say power, I think it's underestimated. Uh, it's an understatement. Um, so one of the key things that happened recently is OpenAI launched what is uh, the new iteration of the, the engine, if you will, that, that enables uh, chat GPT to work, and that is GPT-4. Uh, and basically, right, we're talking about a large language model, uh, generative, generative AI. So a large language model... Uh, is essentially an AI or machine learning that can take in massive amounts of information, data, uh, you know, uh, unstructured data, and make sense of it, right? Give you back feedback, give you back outputs. Uh, and now with its new capabilities, it can even accept images uh, and other, other non-structured um, data sort of inputs. Take all of that and really make, make it into something <laughs> that is leverageable, right? And now with chat, uh, with GPT-4, um, the capabilities are really impressive. They, they showed how they, they leveraged um, the solution or excuse me, the technology to uh, take uh, basic exams like we would take, right? The LSAT or the ACT or the SAT. Uh, and, and even, for example, in a bar exam, GPT-4 performed in the top 10% of test takers, right? So scary. It's scary powerful. It, it's incredible what it can process. Um, and so... You know, really just wanted to kind of highlight what they're doing. Uh, again, you know, it's interesting to see the ways in which some of these uh, things are being used. I've, I've seen, uh, I saw something the other day, someone asked it, and you can go on and play with it, right? I mean, I think they uh, have it open pretty much for anyone. And, and now you're seeing organizations begin to uh, leverage it in their, in their own work, right? Engaging it through API, which is another one of their big announcements. But you've seen a lot of wacky use cases, right? I saw someone ask it uh, to explain quantum physics to a child in the style of Snoop Dogg. So <laughs> there's, there's lots of ways to use this. I'm sure you've seen them, Julie. Um, <laughs> funny ways in which people are, 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 are leveraging this. But, but what's also scary, right, back to HR having to kind of deal with this is in addition to use it in their day-to-day -day, is the fact that you have employees potentially putting sensitive data into it, right? Uh, there was a story of a CEO putting, putting information in there 
and asking it for, um, I think strategic help or something along the line. So yeah, it's opened up a lot of cans of worms here, but, um, you know, really uh, exciting stuff, right? We talked about some of the use cases earlier that ADP is looking at with AI and all of the HCMs are, uh, but ChatGPT, I think, is taking things to a whole other level with its power uh, and just the sheer volume of data it can it can it can work through in a very quick time and make you know make some sort of sense out of it. That's right. So I think we're well into our topic, right? As we even just talk about the news, because we thought this would be a great time to yes. expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I think you yeah. And the other thing I think they announced too that's important to point out too is that just their API approach, right? So now they've put it into the hands of large enterprise type customers, but also big tech, right? So if there are a number of firms that are using this and, and connecting it into things uh, that they've already built, right? I've heard Shopify is using it um, to build out personalized assistance for shopping. Uh, Instacart is doing things with it as well to create uh, more of a, you know, shoppable answers to customers' product questions. So you can certainly see how this could could come over to to HR very quickly, especially now that it's gotten into the hands of these these enterprise grade solutions. But um, let's talk about what's the reality, right? Um, you know, the title for this for this uh, episode is really around, you know, is it is AI a game changer for HR or is it a uh, game over type situation? And so I wanted to really just sort of dig into it a little bit with you, Julie, and see what you're seeing um, on the front line. So maybe maybe we could just start there. Like, what's the reality, right? We 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 know that these solutions. If you look at any modern solution today, I, I get behind the the, in the the hood, if you will, of everything from payroll to HCM to point solutions across the HR spectrum and anything with worth its salt, anything modern today is being built with AI just layered in, right? At, at all, Absolutely. at all paths, NLP for virtual assistants and certainly the machine learning, which something like a chat GPT is, right? It's a deep learning. It's even beyond, it's the next level of machine learning. It's, it's, it's being trained. Um, these things are, are coming to, to HR and payroll at scale. But I thought we could just sort of talk about what's the reality, Julia? Like, what's what's really making its way out there, and has it has it arrived uh, to the frontline practitioner at this point? Yeah, that's such a great that's a, such a great uh, place to go, right? From uh, the art of the possible and what providers are doing, because uh, many uh, buyers, many HR organizations want to get uh, to the place where they're using those efficiencies and those technologies. But you mentioned something even just in the GPT-4 basics, which is, you know, they're taking massive amounts of data and, and creating insights and, and learnings from them. And, and your average client doesn't have massive amounts of data, right? <laughs> yes, so, yeah. So, so when you think about how do, I, how do I tap into that type of power when, you know, I'm maybe not the biggest fish in the pond. I'm not a Walmart or, you know, a PepsiCo or Coca-Cola or someone ginormous with massive amounts of data. And that's where I think we see providers um, really stepping up and coming to the plate first. And so, uh, you know, as kind of a Gen 1 uh, adoption of some of these items, we see a lot of buyers are interested in and want to understand how the provider is embedding and using tools and this sort of efficiency um, and where they can leverage it across multiple uh, clients. And uh, that gives them kind of a scale to bring some of these things to market that maybe they can't touch on their own. And so, you know, yeah. for the first the first gen, I think, um, that we'll see of this, unless you happen to be one of those very, very large buyers who's tapping into these technologies and finance and other areas of your organization, will be going uh, or expecting that the providers are embedding these sorts of things with the types of use cases that we called out in our ADP update um, that are practical, pragmatic, and uh, and and are a game changer for whatever scale, you know, I happen to have in house. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, if you think about it, we're already living in symbiosis with these things, right? It's in your pocket, right? Whatever yeah. phone you have has a chat assistant. Uh, I've got one of the chat assistants on my desk. I'm not going to say her name. She'll wake up and um, she might order something. So, uh, but, but they're all around us, right? And I think that you've already seen a lot of the chatbot capability certainly coming into HR. I feel like there's not a solution out there that doesn't have at least a virtual assistant anymore. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's certainly a lot of... Um, there's a lot of angst around this, and I think it's partly the media, to be honest with you. But I saw a survey, and I apologize, I don't know who did this. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at an infographic that I grabbed. Um, and they saw, they were asked, they asked uh, practitioners, you know, is this a friend or a foe? What do you think? And it was about 50-50. About 57% saw it as an opportunity, while about 43% saw it as a threat. And 
I get it, right? I think that it's important to understand that, yes, artificial intelligence will in fact replace jobs, right? Hard stop. That's, that's, the, that's the case. And not just in HR, but everywhere, right? It's going to replace the stuff no one wants to do or that is not worth doing uh, or, or there's a way for you to do something uh, with that time better, right? So for example, uh, all the ticking and tying and payroll, right? I talk about this all the time. That is a monotonous, silly, redundant, error-prone, awful experience for for how you run payroll. Those of us uh, old old folks <laughs> that came up in that world, we know all too well the hell of that. And so, there's no reason a payroll practitioner should be doing that anymore. That work should really be uh, surface to them, right? Hey, here's what the anomalies are. Go and act on these things with your expertise. And so, I, I think it's important to understand that yes, it will replace some jobs. But what I think it's going to do is actually create totally different jobs in the same way that any technology has in the past. Um, and I think there's just it, it's an exciting opportunity for payroll in my or excuse me it, for HR and payroll in my in my opinion. There's just there's so many like Julie. I, I was thinking about this right. Take this use case right. We, you've got all this stuff when you work. You work. You've worked in consulting for many many years, right? Mm -hmm. um, I did. I did as well. For for I, I worked for Deloitte for example for for three and a half years. And one of the craziest things I always was so frustrated by was the fact that we would have this knowledge base, right? And this happens in every company, whether you're a consultant or not. But I feel like in consulting, it's even more compounded because we're all out there doing all these things, right? We're all out there uh, building our frameworks and working with our clients and leveraging the methodologies we've been trained. Um, and then you'll run across this thing that's like out of the box, right? And you're like, and you don't know how to solve it because you haven't come across it before, but someone out there in your organization has solved it. And they do have documentation and data and information, but it's sitting on their laptop. It's, maybe it's not in the knowledge base. And then you've got to find that person somehow to be able to know that they have the answer to the thing that you're looking for. And what I think about when I think about uh, something like large language models and generative AI is the ability to take all of that knowledge base stuff and all the stuff on our laptops and drop it into this database that can make sense of it, right? And you can search and quickly find those things and surface that, that methodology that's buried somewhere on someone's hard drive or the notes that they took down and learned how to solve, but never had the chance to go and transfer it to the rest of the organization. So that's just one that I personally feel like uh, jumps out at me when I think about huge amounts of data and how you could make sense of it uh, and get down to an answer and get down to something that you need right away. So that that's that's one I, I'm just excited about. Um, yeah. Well, I would say in an ADP upcoming uh, yeah. research report, we got a sneak preview of that. And uh, the topic of conversation was just, um, you know, uh, keeping resources or having resources available and excited to fit uh, payroll of the future, right? The needs that are out there. And even after all of the innovations in, you know, let's say robotic process automation, which hit transactional activities first, um, they still log 22% of what uh, payroll folks are doing is uh, kind of reconciling between HR and payroll activities. Yeah. Uh, as you know, a monotonous part of the job that isn't, you know, is doesn't attract new talent and the youth of today. And so there's the point is there's there's still plenty of opportunity left for AI and RPA and the different automation techniques to impact and and uh, perform some of the work. And the other thing that I, you know, think folks don't uh, really think about too much is it's not a binary choice. Like friend, you know, we say jokingly friend or foe, right? Uh, but the fact of the matter is in, in HR, where these technologies really provide the most value is in a, uh, is uh, interlaced with human decision-making, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's really meant to take the, the monotony and the grunt work and the, you know, the precision work that uh, that uh, tools can perform in some cases so much better than us and put it before the practitioner so that it accelerates their ability to decide and act uh, with the nuances and the empathy that we're really trying to keep a, a yes. center in our trade, right? Yes. Um, and so if you can think about it in through that lens, uh, it makes sense that it, it that it's an accelerant, right? More than anything, more than a replacement. Yes. Um, and, and I think that allows you to get a lot more excited about what's going on here. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I think we're moving from that automation to augmentation sort of stage now. Uh, it's been coming, right? And it's been inching there, but I think this is going to speed it up. And you mentioned a lot of really, really good points there about empathy and other skills that I think are going to be so critical 
uh, as these things take away the monotony and, and the stuff we don't really want to deal with or we shouldn't be wasting time with. And that's going to be this stuff around uh, the ability to be creative, right? The ability to have um, you know, emotional intelligence and, and, a, and a, what I would maybe call a cognitive fluidity, right? Being able to sort of um, leverage these things and make sense of what it's being told, because there also has to be a, a check and a balance of these things too, right? Just in the same way you would check and balance anything. Um, I think you can't just blindly trust it, right? You have to look at it and say, hey, it doesn't make sense, right? What it's saying or what it's surfacing. So uh, things like creativity and just, you're right, em empathy and, and other areas of, and, and people leadership, right? just leading people and helping people make good decisions. Um, I think all of that stuff, and, and let's don't forget communication. I, I harp on this all the time with my kids. Um, you know, so many of those soft skills, I think are gonna really bubble up as being sought after versus maybe, uh, you know, the other stuff. And at the end of the day, I think you've also got to maintain a very good understanding of, of technology in the future. You're really gonna have to understand how these things are playing with your, with your environment, your data. Yeah, I'm going to throw out a really cool, yeah. since we're hot on the you know spring, <laughs> spring circuit of conferences where a lot of new data yes. and research comes out. One of the SSOW, uh, SSOM data stats uh, was talking about shared services and staffing and skilling and the shortage of, of skills, you know, which which 70 or more percent of folks feel. And, and I thought it was incredibly interesting for them to have found that in looking for the variety of skills needed for shared services, there's now fewer than a third of organizations that focus on the functional depth of knowledge ah. versus two thirds that focus on the sort of skills that underlie a service orientation and, yeah. you know, exactly what we're talking about. And I do believe that that's partly because there are is a lot more intelligence available um, from some of these automation and, and other tools to help supplement the, you know, the deep functional expertise that before was irreplaceable. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's going to change things, right? And I think we have to, like, like, uh, like everything in in our world, we're going to have to remain adaptable. Um, something I'm very proud. I learned very young in the military to you know remain as adaptable and agile as possible. And I think that's what you have to you have to be doing now. Learn, just keep learning. Learn how these things work. Learn to understand uh, how they can make make your life easier. How they can elevate your team and, and give you that empowerment. So. So Julie, how do you, um, I want to ask you the, a couple of things personally here. So how do you, uh, let me think about how to say this. So how would, how do you, how do you pr sort of guide buyers in looking at this stuff? What do you sort of, what's the, what's the way in which they ought to look at these, adopting these in context with their strategic goals or the things they're trying to accomplish? Like, what do you, what would you recommend? Yeah. So um, what I recommend here is uh, there are certain, there are certain parts or components of this that are. Um, you know, the nature of the technology or the nature of the beast that any provider is going to bring forward, whether you're searching for a tool or whether you're evaluating managed services and uh, they have embedded tools. Uh, and so I, I really see a lot of the heavy lifting still today uh, being done by the non-SME uh, um, constituency on your, you know, in your RFP processes, right? Yeah. So, they have a finance, usually a finance adjunct to the team, and that's uh, that's usually an incredibly important role for focusing on the stability and um, you know the 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 size and basically the construct of the organization, whether it's a software vendor or a provider that you're looking at. And IT will dig deep into the security and the you know GDPR aspects, the compliance um, from a mechanical perspective, right? The, me the mechanics and the integration. Um, safety and security, and then your contractual um, uh, protections from legal, where you start looking at liability and so forth. So these are team members that sometimes are um, are not as uh, as involved in search and selection of tools or services as the payroll SMEs themselves or the HR SMEs themselves, and yet they play an increasingly important role in looking beyond. Uh, the, 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 the functional compliance and the functional actions that were transactions that were looking for these tools to drive. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you see the, 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 this bubbling into or coming up on RFPs now that you're starting to have questions to vendors around this? Hopefully, I hope. Yes, yes. But, yeah. Sure. And at a first level, again, as I would say, kind of Gen 1, it's, it's infancy other than, you know, incredibly large or advanced organizations. Usually uh, it starts as what have you done or how have you embedded and how are you making use of in meaningful ways these sorts of tools and so providers are 
starting to flex the muscle to differentiate themselves. You know, they've all had to come up with use cases and it's, it's really been fun over the last few years to see, you know, some, some quite useless use cases <laughs> come about just yeah. for the sake of proving that I, I have RPA or AI and ML type uh, capabilities. And then eventually, you know, over some scale and with a little bit of time, they refine their own muscle and start to bring more and more meaningful use cases and meaningful applications to the table. And that's where it gets exciting. Yeah. A any key use cases you're seeing that are um, most impactful right now? You're, you're kind of like the main ones you're, you're finding? You know, I think still uh, from a from a payroll and an integrations perspective, just the grunt work of a lot of validations yeah. and checks and balances are really the most practical. Where totally. folks are just dying to go is, you know, some more of that uh, service uh, knowledge base, you know, type of um, support. And yet that's yeah. also where you have to wrap your hands around the ethics and, and risk and, you know, and, and some more, uh, some more big picture types of uh, things to get. Yes. That. Yeah. That's a great point. The ethics, right. They're, they're, every vendor has an ethics and AI sort of statement responsibility approach. Um, and I think it's important to have a conversation with your vendor about that, right. Hopefully that's being something uh, been something that ven buyers are, are, are discussing with their vendors and understanding, because again, you need to understand what these things are doing. Uh, you need to understand how they work. You need to understand how they're applied. Um, there can be some danger, right, in surfacing information that says, hey, Julie's, uh, Julie's about to leave the organization, right? She's a flight risk. Um, that's, that, that may not be accurate, right? And, and, and I, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, let's be honest. Like, I, I think it's, I think it's almost a, uh, I don't think it's a scientific fact, but, but I believe it's fairly well understood or, or at least uh, accepted that humans are inherently biased and humans are training these things. So you have to be very careful uh, with this stuff. And I think that while we're in this stage of sort of exploration is what I would sort of feel like we are doing right now with HR. Um, I think you have to really tread carefully uh, with anything, understand the use cases, understand or that you're trying to solve and understand how it's going to work and what it's going to do and where the where the audits and controls are to these things to make sure that you're not doing, uh, you know, irreversible damage to your to your brand or your your end result. Right. Yeah, That's employees, right. I mean, yeah. And initially, you're kind of toying with uh, with uh, some capabilities to create a little bit of a, a, a virtual water cooler. Yeah. Where, yeah, where there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, things being surmised based on you know evidence and observations, and that's not unlike a water cooler. Some of yeah. which might be uh, quite um, um, pr premonitory, and others of which is just is just wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, agreed, agreed. Yeah, and I think I mean, look, I think as people get you know uh, begin to see the impact and how it can how it can help make their jobs easier, make them. Uh, smarter, if you will, more intelligent and have better decision making, uh, insight driven decision making. I think they're going to, you know, people will understand the, the power and the impact. Yeah, so look, well, just to kind of round this out a little bit, right? I know we could, uh, we could probably go on and on, um, but I wanted to just uh, obviously, you know, kind of close this out here. W let's talk about the change management element of this, right? Because this, because again, we, I think that's the theme of almost what we've been saying over and over without saying it is, there's a lot of things that are going to change. The roles are going to change, right? It's going to become better, uh, be better focused work, right? And not this monotonous sort of manual stuff we've been doing in the past. And I love all the things that it does for, for HR. I mean, I think we're talking mostly back office, but like, let's think about like the recruiting part of this and, and the ability to find, uh, you know, people and the ability to train people. I mean, learning alone, I think is going to be really big impact here where you can bring a lot of data together and give people, um, you know, very good, succinct insights off of all of that and teach them um, very, very strategically. So, but the change management ele element of this, what do you feel is is important here, Julia, to, to remember? Because this is a key piece we always talk about in transformation, but where does this sort of fit in when it comes to things like AI? Yeah, well, my first thought, Pete, is um, broadly speaking, uh, change management probably needs to address just the, the overarching um, concerns, wonderment, uh, uncertainty of what can or cannot these tools do in my environment, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and how do, how will we as an employer be using them? Um, there isn't a person as we move to the cloud that hasn't wondered, you know, what does my employer want? Do they watch things? What are they doing? <laughs> right? And so this just brings that dimension to a new level. 
Um, and um, in order to make sure that we are able to drive some adoption and get folks excited about it and not um, concerned about it, we have to first talk about what it is and how we're going yeah. to use it and how it will uh, enable an employee experience or how it will enable um, you know, a manager's job um, activities and take out some of the mundane, you know, let's assume that's what we're doing, right? Um, that that's, that feels like step one um, is to start to tear down some of the barriers of the unknown. Uh, yeah, to me. agreed. Yeah, and you know, I think this is a key pathway to HR truly being able to become strategic, right? I mean, yeah. they, I feel like HR has been whipped a little bit, a lot, well, I shouldn't say a little bit, a lot about not being strategic enough. Um, we saw that in, again, we always reference the uh, sapient data, but we saw that come up, that st strategic HR or HR just isn't being strategic enough or, or delivering enough of that value. So I think this is a pathway to them being relieved of that monotony and minutia that will give them the insights uh, and the guidance to be able to do more and be a, a, a better strategic partner and have more strategic outcomes. So uh, I'm very excited about it personally. And, and maybe the panic button there is, geez, we've been waiting forever to step up and be that strategic partner. Like, yeah. We don't want to see GPT, chat GPT step up and be more strategic than me, right? <laughs> I mean, honestly, <laughs> yeah. be honest about it. That's a, yep. um, there's some concerns there when you start talking about what its capability is and what uh, use cases are being seen in more broader contexts. It's like, well, if they can write the whole strategy plan, yeah. what chance do I have? <laughs> Or run or run uh, HR like Snoop Dogg. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, look, this has been a really great conversation as always. Um, I know we say this; it's cliche, but we could go on and on. Um, and I'm sure this is this topic is going to be back. Uh, we'll be we'll be talking about this more in the months and years to come. I know it. So um, so it's been, you know been great as always, Julie. Any anything to uh, close out that you'd uh, want to share? No, oh, goodness. Like you say, uh, I'm looking forward to our next thing here. And please, folks, check out uh, not only the podcast here, but look for some of the blogs and activities that are coming out to give you some more detail. If you have any questions or want to know what's what's the news from the conference circuit in the spring, reach out to Peter or I or reach out to the podcast LinkedIn and um, we'll make sure we, we share what we know. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for that, Julie. It's good talking to you as always. Thanks. Have a good one. Okay. Okay.